Good morning, everybody. My name's Sam. I'm on staff here at the church. Oh, thanks. Uh, we are glad you're here today. Thanks for being in church, especially if you're new. Welcome. You received a program when you came in. There's a ton of helpful information inside of there about how you can get connected at the church. Also, helpful expectations about how we're going to be seeking the Lord throughout our gathering today. So I'd encourage you to look at your program. Also encourage you to stop by the welcome corner out in the atrium. Great place to get connected. There's someone there that would love to meet you. So I'd like to prepare our hearts to move into a time of worshiping the Lord. And as I was thinking about this, I've been reading through the book of Psalms these past couple of weeks, which has me thinking about worship a lot, uh, because that's the book of Psalms. It's a lot of worship. And I've been thinking, what does that word really mean? Uh, how do I define, understand worshiping the Lord? And a functional definition that helps me work out worship in my life to the Lord is worship is agreeing with God. Worship is a part of our relationship with God where we come into agreement with him and we say, God, I believe you are who you say you are. I set my faith and my trust in your promises. I agree with you. I worship you. That's just been a helpful definition for me, and it's an opportunity we have this morning as we worship the Lord to agree with him. There are a lot of those types of statements in the first song we're going to sing. It says often, I believe this or I believe that. That's our worship, that's our agreeing with the Lord that he is who he says he is and he's trustworthy, he's worthy of our worship. So as we transition into worship, I'd invite all of you to stand with me and we are going to pray through a psalm. It's going to be on the screens. It may be helpful to you to follow along, it may not be because I'm going to be using this as kind of a roadmap for our prayer. I'll be praying through these phrases and adding my own prayers in between some of the phrases, but this will be our roadmap as we prepare our hearts to worship the Lord. Psalm 63, you God are my God. You are our God, Lord. We have no other God before you and earnestly I seek you. We seek you this morning, Lord, earnestly, with intention, with desire, with longing. We earnestly seek you this morning through our worship, Lord. I thirst for you, my whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. God, we acknowledge that this world, this earth is a dry and parched land often where there is no water, but we worship you, the God who is living water. We thirst for you, we long for you, we desire your reviving rain in this dry and parched land, Lord. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. God, we have seen you in this sanctuary. We've beheld your power and your glory, and we desire to see it again today. Will you come in power and glory and dwell with us? We desire to be with you in your sanctuary today. Because of your love, it's, your love is better than life. My lips will glorify you. God, our lips glorify you because of your love. It's better than life. Thank you for your love, God. I will praise you as long as I live in your name. I will lift up my hands. I will be fully satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. God, we praise you with singing lips this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
from this song as we were singing through the chorus. First of all, I want to thank you all. You're doing a really good job worshiping God this morning. I can feel it in the room, and I'm grateful that you're choosing to praise Him today. Um, but as we are singing through that chorus, I stand on the chain breaking, miracle making, powerful name of Jesus. I was thinking of, I saw a person in the room and it just triggered my memory that the Lord's moved for them in a powerful way this year. I'm sorry, guys. God is really good. Um, and I was thinking of my own life and how God showed up this year. So I wanna take a moment for all of us just to think, reflect on this year and think about maybe one really good thing that the Lord did, uh, provided for you in a specific way. Maybe he was just with you in a hard season or a lonely season. Could be something big, could be something small. But I want us just to sing through this chorus maybe a couple more times and make it really personal, sing it straight to the Lord and thank him for those things that he's done. Um, and recognize him for who he is. Uh, I feel like there might be a couple people in the room, maybe you can't think of anything right now, and that's okay. I want all of us that can think of something to sing this with such faith that it's almost a prayer for those who need the Lord to show up in 2024. Does that make sense? Um, so I'm not, I'm not gonna follow the click because I'm way off the team, sorry. <laughs> We're just going to sing through this chorus a couple times. And I stand on a chain breaking, miracle making, powerful name of Jesus on the
praises fill the temple today. down. We just thank you and acknowledge who you are. We agree with who you are this morning and we love you so much. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah, thank you all for worshiping with us this morning. Middle schoolers, you all are headed to your core class out there. Your leader will meet you out in the back. Uh, And everyone else, go ahead and greet those around you before you take a seat. Hey everyone, glad to have you here. Thanks for attending church this morning with us. Um, I'm Andrew Kurtz. I'm Carol Ann Master. We're both on staff here at the church. Thank you so much. Hey, we are so glad to see you guys today. If you are new, special welcome to you. Hope you have a great experience. If you've not yet filled out a connect card, it is one of the best first steps you can take to getting more connected at the church. You can either scan the QR code that's on the uh, seat back in front of you, Or you can grab the actual card, fill it out, and then drop it off at the welcome corner in the atrium following the service. Yes, and one of the things that they will point you to if you're newer around the church is um, a first step called Next. And uh, Next is a series of four classes where you're going to learn about the vineyard, our beliefs, and what's next for you. Thank, thank you. You're, that was the most laughter I got Actually, from that. It was that. the best of all the services. Thank you. Oh, that was a horrible joke. Uh, okay, so next, get, focus, Andrew. Next uh, happens every Sunday morning, starting this upcoming Sunday, during the 950 service 
out there in the chapel, so um, not too far away. And there's no specific order to complete these classes. You can do them in any order you'd like, but um, I would encourage you to go through all of them because you will get a great understanding of the Vineyard Church as, it, as uh, what we believe, all that. Um, you get a, a view of your own spiritual gifts and some of the next steps in your journey with Jesus. So whether you're new to the Vineyard or if you're just looking to get more involved here at the church, next is the place for you. Yeah, and we're going to be moving into our message time soon. But before we're done, if you would take a look at your program, there are a bunch of opportunities coming up that can help you find your way in 2024. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of stuff. Like literally look in there. There's more than we're going to announce. But a couple of the things that you can be paying attention to are Financial Peace University is coming up. Financial Peace University. I'm guessing... There's a couple of people in the room that you are dreading looking at your Christmas credit card statement. This class is for you. So uh, you should check that out. A um, couple other things. Open prayer and worship starts back up in just over a week from now. Connexus, a group for third, fourth, and fifth graders, is starting up as well. And uh, young adults is having their... 2024 kickoff. There's some young adults up here. If you're between the ages of 18 and 30, you should check it out this Tuesday at 7 p.m. and a bunch of other stuff. Look in your program. Yes, and right now, if you've kept your cell phone on, we would just ask you to turn it on silent. And if you chose to keep a child with you in the service and they get a little too restless, we would just ask that you take them out to the atrium where you can still watch and listen to the message out by the fireplace. And we don't pass a plate here for the offering at the Vineyard, but giving financially back to God is a way of worshiping. So if you're looking to give in some way, then there are offering boxes throughout the building, as well as you can explore other options to give online at thevineyard.org slash give. Let's pause and pray for the offering today. So Lord, thank you. Uh, we just pause to thank you for everything that you've given us. There's, there's so much that we can be grateful for. Um, so many blessings that you've poured out in our lives. And so we just pause on that. We, we thank you for everything that you've done. Lord, we recognize that uh, the things that you've given us are not ours to keep. They're, they're gifts from you. And so it's our privilege, it's our honor to, to offer them back to you. Um, and, and so we just ask that you give us wisdom to be good stewards of the finances that come into this church Help us to make wise decisions with all of the gifts that people offer today. So we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Final thing from us, we want to celebrate some of the amazing things that happened around the church in 2023. So watch this video and enjoy. We shouldn't be following what the world's doing. We should be figuring out how to do this thing better together. And how we answer these questions will have great influence over our lives. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That if we follow God's Word that is unchanging, our lives will be different than the world, and it will be better. And God said, I want them to be at the manger, because who did Jesus come for? Spiritual failures who need Savior. I slowly began to distance myself from Christ. I married an atheist at 23, and that drove me further away from Christ. I felt as if God was understanding the cries coming from my heart and repairing what no one could on this earth. I now help my best friend remember that Jesus loves her. I can confidently say that Jesus is a top priority in my life, which I couldn't say before. I was able with prayer to pull away from the relationship and slowly rebuild my friendships. I grew closer to the Lord and began to pray more. I am completely ready to commit my whole life to Jesus forever and that's why I'm getting baptized. God, allow me to use my eyes to see and my ears to hear what it is that you want me to do. I'm here today to publicly declare that my life has always been and will continue to be in Jesus' hands. And I know no matter how hard it gets, that God has healed me and that he loves me. I realized just then that it's not about me, it's about Jesus. So I'm here today to declare that Jesus is my Lord and Savior.
The way that we walk with Jesus is together. And my plea to you is chase after God to do miracles in your life. Because of God's power, the, the impossible not only becomes possible, the impossible actually becomes likely. God is determined to give us our daily bread, which may or may not be as much as your neighbor. You have released the generosity within us. And I thank you for everyone who has given. It's not the amount, but it's the heart that matters. Can I have a hand on my head? Can you see anything? Popcorn. Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to the We Are... You got to start over. My head was down like... <laughs> you were the girls in the so pretty. <laughs> <laughs> if you chose to keep Cha with you... Get it out! <laughs> ah! Yay! Hi! Bloopers. <laughs> We're gonna get it. Now, light up for the... Fog. Out of it. Oh, the, there's a fly. Goat. At the uh, fly. Yes, thank you, Vineyard. Yeah. Well, happy New Year. Good to see you all this morning. My name is Cameron Clark, and I'm one of the pastors here at the church. Don't clap. You don't have to clap. He's clapping. Thanks, brother. Appreciate you. <laughs> uh, before we jump into our message, quick uh, announcement. Next week, we're kicking off a brand new series called Battlegrounds. Battlegrounds, life is worth fighting for. Here's a little bit about it. We're going to be looking at common areas in our life that we would be good to fight for in 2024? And how can we, through Jesus, win those battles? So I would encourage you all to be here next week as we kick off our new series. So for our message today, we're gonna be in the book of 1 Kings. So if you have your paper Bibles, you can go ahead and turn there now. Or if you have your digital Bibles, you can get it that way too. Um, So a quick story. Not too long ago, I was on my phone scrolling, watching videos like I normally do. I'm sure uh, some of you all do that as well. And I came across these set of videos called Things I Wish I Knew Before I Was in My 30s. And me being in my 30s, naturally, I was drawn to them wondering to myself, what is it that I need to know that I may not know? Now, what I found out about these videos is that they share multiple things Uh, life hacks. Um, They share everyday items that we don't use correctly. But what I found most intriguing were regularly used items or somewhat regularly used items that we just don't use to the full potential. And so I wanted to share some of them that I found were pretty interesting. So here's one that I found was interesting. Uh, Everybody should know probably what this is. is a takeout Chinese box for your food. Um, And and, and maybe you're like me, but did you know that there's more potential when you eat these other than just opening it up from the top and eating? These were designed in such a way that you could actually snap that little pin off at the top and it turns into a plate. That's its full potential right there. That's how they were designed. I thought that was pretty interesting. Another one that I found is uh, an oven. Here we go. Um, I don't know why I brought the picture. We all know what an oven looks like, but I wanted to share the picture really because I wanted to point our attention to the bottom of the oven. If you look down there, there's a drawer. And this is pretty controversial. I asked uh, some people on staff and it was about 50-50. But did you know that that oven has more potential and that drawer specifically has more potential than just 
storage. Did you know that? I don't know. Maybe some of you guys didn't know that. It has two actual functions to it then that's not storage, and that is to uh, keep foods warm that you've already made before you serve so they can keep them warm. And the second one is for broiling. So that's pretty unique. All right. Last one. This is for you Chick-fil-A lovers in the room. Here we go. Um, Yeah, that you can actually put your straw through the back of your chicken nuggets it makes it more functional. You can take them on the go. I actually don't even know if this is real or not. I just saw it and was like, that's pretty cool. Um, so if you go to Chick-fil-A tomorrow and you get some nuggies, just try it. You know, see what happens. But, but I, share, like, I share these. These are funny. These are silly. But one of the things that's so intriguing about these and the reason why I share them is because these are items that some of us, we use re- like relatively regularly and they have more potential to them than what we may use them for. Though, and I would submit, and follow me as we take a spiritual shift here, though you and I, we are much more than a box of nuggets or even an oven, I believe that we, all of us, you and I, were created with potential. Potential to do more than what we ever may think or even imagine. But deeper than that, I want us to understand that we were created with a spiritual potential. A spiritual potential to do big and amazing things for the kingdom of God. And I think it might be helpful if we actually defined what I mean when I say spiritual potential. So here's a, here's a definition of what I mean by spiritual potential. Having the capacity to become or, to, or develop into a more mature, deeper, and loving follower of Jesus. That sounds good. That's what God has placed in all of us. And I know when I'm bringing up a word like potential in this context, it could come off that I'm implying that you're not doing good, that you're not doing well, and that there's a lot of improvement that you need to make. I want to be mindful. That's not my intention, even though some of you all would say you may not be doing well. That's not my intention or my heart or what I mean by this. What I mean is this. No matter where you are spiritually, whether you're good, whether you're doing poor, whether you don't know how you're doing, no matter where you are spiritually, here's the good news. I believe that God created you for more. God created you with the spiritual potential to do even more than you could ever possibly think or imagine. And this isn't just a Cameron thought. This isn't just an idea that I came up with, but this is, a, this is an actual biblical principle. In Ephesians chapter two, it says it this way. For we, you and I, are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus, here we go, to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. We were made by God, for God, for more, with an expectation to live a life that is dedicated to him and to him alone, to live in that and operate in that truth that we are his and we are meant for more. So to sum this idea up, this is what I want us to grasp as we dive deeper into this message. God created you with an incredible amount of spiritual potential. God created all of us in this room with an incredible amount of spiritual potential, more than what you could ever imagine. Despite what your history says, despite what what others may think about you, despite the, the things that you may feel or you may say about yourself, you were created for more. A life that's not marked and okay with complacency but a heart that actually longs for more of what God wants for you and to long for more of God in your life. So as we bring this in the room, I think it begs a question for us to consider as we dive deep into this idea of spiritual potential. It's a question for you to consider and for all of us. Here it is. Am I living up to my full spiritual potential? When you, when, you, when you view the landscape of your life, would you say that you are living up to your full spiritual potential? The answer will probably be no, not in all areas. We may not be living up to our full spiritual potential. So if the answer to that question is no, is I don't think I'm living up to my full spiritual potential, then I think there's another question that follows that question. If no, then how can I live up to my full spiritual potential? And I, want it, I, want, I share this because I want us to grasp that you and I, we were all created for more. 
for more than what we are seeing or more than what we could ever imagine, that we can be filled and do things beyond what we could imagine. I thought of the, the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians. You've probably, some of you have probably seen these before. But the fruit of the Spirit is, here we go, love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Did you know that we have the potential, you and I, have the potential to be filled with these Not just to be filled with these, but to operate in these. Did you know that you could be not just filled with love and feel love, but you could actually be a person that's not angry, but pouring out love on other people in all situations? Did you know that you could be a person with self-discipline, that you don't have to give in to the desires of the things that pull you away from what God is calling you to do, that you can actually be a self-disciplined person that's focus is primarily and solely focused on God. So, wouldn't it be great if not only were we filled with these daily and regularly, but we were operating in them to our full potential? I think the answer is yes. And here's the truth. God created us, you and I, with the ability to live lives that go beyond our natural selves, to live in the spirit filled with God and be people that live for the sole fact of glorifying God and living in the more, living in the potential that God has placed inside of each of us. But I want us to understand this as we go deeper. None of this spiritual potential that I'm speaking about is on our own. This is all from God. It's all from God and it's all for God. Because of God's great love for us, he has given us the potential to be more and to do more. But again, it's up to us to accept that more. We can reject it, and I hope we don't. But it's from God, it's for God, and we must accept it. We can't just recognize it. We have to recognize it and then accept it and live in it. Today, for our text, I want to take a look at a man who lived up to his full spiritual potential. We're going to be looking at a man in scripture named Elisha. Elisha was a prophet in the Old Testament that God used to do some really big things. He was, for his time, the most spiritually powerful person in the nation. Here's just a handful of really great things that Elisha uh, did during his time. He parts the Jordan River. There was a river, people needed to get across it, and they were able to safely and in a dry manner get through that river without anybody being hurt. That's pretty cool. Here's another one. He purifies the water for Jericho. There was rancid water. Water was making people sick. People were dying, and Elisha purified the water and made it drinkable. It's pretty neat. Here's another one. He prays for a woman to have a kid who can't have kids. There was a woman who was, was unable to give birth, and Elisha actually uh, prays for her, and she actually gives birth to a son. And then here's one more for us. He brings the son of a woman back to life. A young man had died, and Elisha brought him back to life. But I bring this up because before all these things happened, who was Elisha? Before all these things, who was Elisha? Elisha wasn't mentioned before this moment, this call that we're going to read in just a moment. He doesn't carry any special job or duties. Elisha was a farmer, a regular everyday worker, just like many of us. Nothing special of note on him. So again, how was he able to do these things? How did he get there? It started with a moment where he accepted his calling and spiritual potential and it set him up for God to do all these things through him and more. So to set our text up a little bit more, there's two men that we're gonna be reading about today. One man's name is Elijah and he's the current prophet, super spiritual guy. And then another one, I know it sounds just like it, but Elisha, so Elijah and Elisha. Why they have similar sounding names? Don't know, could have been Elijah and Cameron, but it was Elijah and Elisha. Maybe we'll know one day. Maybe we won't, that's okay. But we're gonna pick up in 1 Kings 19, 19 through 21. So Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Shaphat. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen and he himself was driving the 12th pair. 
Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. A quick pause real quick. What this means is that Elijah was actually calling Elisha to come follow him to be his disciple and soon to be his successor when Elijah moved on. And Elisha knew what this meant, okay? Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come with you. Go back, Elijah replied, what have I done to you? So Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat and gave it to the people and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and became his servant. The title of today's message is Unlocking Your Spiritual Potential. And in this story, what we see is we see the call of Elisha, the beginning part of his story and what he did to ultimately unlock his spiritual potential. And my hope for all of us listening today is that we would learn from the story, the call of Elisha, as to what it looks like for us to unlock all that God has for us. So again, no matter where you're at in your faith, You're new to your faith, you're exploring your faith, you're experiencing your faith. I'm gonna repeat it, God has more. God wants more. God has given you the potential to unlock more in your life. So before I pray, would you pause, would you consider the different areas in your life that God might be actually calling you to unlock more in? Maybe for some of us, it's in your homes, it's with your families. God's wanting to unlock more in there. Maybe it's at work, maybe it's with your finances, maybe it's with your friends, could be your God time, your prayer time. I don't know what that is for you personally, but I would ask that you would pause and consider, and as we pray, think of those of where God might want to call you deeper and unlock more. And so with that in mind, would you pray with me? So God, first and foremost, we say thank you for being a God that has given us potential to do more than we could ever imagine Thank you that you love us. Thank you that you are here in this moment. So Father, we pray that you would open up our hearts to receive what you have to speak to us this morning. We want to be more, how do I say this? We want to be better at following you. We want to love you deeper. We want to love you more. So Father, we love you. It's in your son's name we pray, amen. So first fill in, unlocking your spiritual potential requires finishing well. Finishing well. Elisha understood what was expected of him when Elijah showed up. He knew that where he was heading was requiring him to leave things behind and to go follow this big calling that was now on his life. And so what I want us to do is I want us to look at the response of Elisha when this big calling was placed on his life. In verse 20 of our text, this is his response. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come with you. And I find this interesting, and the reason why I bring this point up is because in this moment, Elisha then realized where he was heading, what was going to happen, and the first thought in his mind was this, let me go close the loop and honor my mother and father well. Let me go and honor them well. We don't know this for sure, but his parents may not have known that Elijah had shown up and and, and called their son to more, that he was going to follow God. And they could have just said, what happened to our son? Did he die? Did he run away? Did he get kidnapped? Did he vanish? What happened? I think Elisha, in his heart, knew this is an opportunity for me to go and to honor my mother and father and close this season out well. And here's a cool part. In the midst of that, finishing well, Elisha honored God through honoring his family. The way he finished was honoring to his family and to God. So the question is, is how do we know that he was honoring to not only his family, but to God? Well, we know this because we know Elisha, being a young Jewish man, would know the law. He would know the Ten Commandments. Like, he would know this one right here. Honor your father and mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. He followed these commands. He knew these. These weren't new to him. 
And he finished well by honoring his mother and father, and through that, he honored God. So I think that brings up a lesson for us to consider in our lives, and here it is. You can fill this in. We, you and I, can honor God through how we finish. You and I can honor God in our lives, in all areas of our lives, through the way that we finish. How we finish things matters. Finishing well means recognizing God's work in you and around you and honoring him through it. And I would submit to you again that it would be really great for us to grasp this truth and apply it in our lives. To step into our full spiritual potential, we must realize that we can honor God through the way that we finish things in our lives. A few examples. Some of us, if you're, if you're in a dating relationship, and you know that that season is coming to a close, the way you close that season matters. It's important, finish that season well. For those of you guys that may be um, leaving a job, you've got a few weeks left or a month left, finish well. Don't just give up, don't just stop. You can honor God and honor those around you by finishing that season well. There's a different kind of a turn here. But finishing well also matters in our prayer life. Here's what I mean. You, when you're praying for your family, you wouldn't get to the last four members of your family and just go, okay, that's good. Maybe you would, I don't know. I hope you wouldn't. No, you finish well. Even in your prayer life, you, get, you finish it. You pray for everyone. This finishing well is a spiritual principle that, again, I believe if we adopt, in our li- adopt into our lives, we can operate even more fully and step into and unlock what God has for us. There's a great story in the book of Luke of 10 men. Some of us have probably read this before, but it's a story of 10 men who had leprosy. It was a bad season in their life. They saw Jesus. They called out to Jesus. They said, Master, would you have pity on us? And, and, and Jesus actually heals them. But I want to look at this story because there's a particular response of one of the men who were healed that I think points to this idea really well of what it means to finish well. In Luke 17, this is what it says. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. This is his response. This is how he finished well. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. This is a great example of what it looks like to finish well. Again, finishing well means recognizing God's work in us and around us and honoring him through it. We have a a rule uh, in student ministries, and it's really a staff rule also. So, um, but it goes like this: We say something like this: We will leave this place better than how we found it. So, when we go somewhere that doesn't belong to us, when it's time to leave, we look at it and we say, "We will leave this place better than how we found it." So, over the summer. Some of you guys may know this, but we have summer camps. We take middle schoolers and high schoolers to a summer camp, and we spend five days in cabins in the middle of the summer. Middle school boys. Whoa, okay? If you ever want to experience, you can sign up and attend, okay? It's, it's, it's a thing to behold, okay? It's pretty stinky in there, but I tell you, the last day... The last day that we're there, we spend a chunk, a majority of our time, the last day of camp, cleaning those cabins. And here's what I mean. If we walked in there when we first got there and there was a little bit of dirt on the ground, I can promise you there's not going to be any dirt when we leave. If there's a little bit of trash on the ground or in the trash can, there's not going to be any trash when we leave. We will leave that place better than how we found it. And we do this for many reasons. We do this for many reasons. Uh, we were entrusted with these cabins, so we honor what was given to us by stewarding it well. The cleaning teams that come in after feel loved because it makes their jobs easier. And it's a time to thank God for giving us a place where we can freely come and meet with him. It's honoring God through love loving others, and respecting what he has given us. And this is what finishing well looks like. And can I tell you, we finish well. So with this idea, personally thinking about our own lives for a moment, if finishing well is honoring God and it's crucial, then here's a question for us to consider. What are the areas of my life that I need to honor God more in? If finishing well is a way that we can honor God and it's honoring to God, are there areas in my life that I can honor God more in? 
For some of us, it's at work. When you get to work, just remember, you are an image bearer of God. And every day that you walk in, you should be able, the second you walk in, to know that I have, you have the opportunity to be God and the face of Jesus and the love of Jesus at work. So when it's 4.30, you don't just give up. At 4.30, you say, I got 30 more minutes to still be the love of God here. If you think about your families, you are a spiritual leader to your spouse, spiritually lead your homes every day take the opportunity to spiritually lead your families if you have kids understand this that every day is an opportunity to spiritually lead your kids to show them that God is number one in this house and if I could just for a moment lean in on this for just a second parents in the room every day you should be showing your kids that God is the main thing God is the biggest thing in that household. He matters more than entertainment. And that was a big one. He matters more than sports. And can I tell you, this is the number, one of the number one issues I see plaguing Christian families across the nation. And if I could submit to you for just a moment, when you, parents, when you stand before God, your kid doesn't stand next to you. Your kid stands on their own before God and he's not gonna turn in his report card. They're not gonna turn in their, their stats from the game. They're gonna have to answer for the way we, that they live their lives. And families, parents, listen up. It's our opportunity to raise them, to put God first, everything else is secondary. Everything else is secondary. God is number one. Show your kids, show your families that God is the most important thing. For those of you all in the room that don't work, understand that you can still take every day as an opportunity to honor the Lord in all that you do. Finish each day well knowing that you put God first. Finish well. Galatians chapter 6 puts it this way. And let us not grow weary of doing good. So let's not grow weary of finishing well. For in due season, we will reap. So we will have blessing and benefit if we do not give up. So don't give up. In all areas of your life, it's not time to give up. Honor God in all that you do. Keep going. So here's the last fill in the blank for this point. Don't quit. Don't quit. Finish well. So unlocking your spiritual potential requires finishing well. And number two, unlocking your spiritual potential requires eliminating the obstacles. Eliminating the obstacles. Verse 21 of our text, it says, he took, speaking of Elisha, he took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat. What Elisha did in this moment was he eliminated any obstacle or symbol of his former life that could hold him back from experiencing what God had placed on his life and what God was ultimately calling him to. He burned the symbol of his former life. He burned the source of his former livelihood. There was no turning back. There was no plan B. There was no safety net. And I believe that Elisha understood here that what he was going to do and who he was ultimately going to become required him to eliminate anything that could be used as an excuse or a reason to run back to. He knew that there was a potential inside of him to do great things for God and nothing was gonna hold him back. And if I could personalize this for myself for just a moment, there's been so many times in my life as I look back on my life where God has called me to more. God has called me and challenged me and led me places. Maybe it's to go pray for somebody, to go to a certain place, to sit and talk with somebody, to lean in, to go deeper. And how many times in my life as I just process it, I go, I haven't done that well. I've come up with excuses because there's fears or obstacles or worries or doubts that come up and creep up into my life. And it's so much easier sometimes to look at those than it is what the Lord is ultimately calling you to do. And I'm not here to shame us, but I know I'm not alone in this. If you think about your life, how many times has God shown up and challenged you and called you to more and called you to deeper? And we say things like this, it just doesn't make sense. Or I just don't know how this is gonna work out. Or I don't think God would actually call me to do that. Or how? I don't want us to live lives like that. I want all of us to point our feet towards Jesus and run with him with all that we have and follow him and trust in him and lean in him no matter what. 
There's a great story in the New Testament of a man named Peter. He's a disciple of Jesus, and there's this great moment where, where Jesus is walking on the water, like he's walking on water. That's really cool. And Peter and the disciples are in the boat. They call out to Jesus, and here's what Jesus' response to, them, to Peter was. It was, come, get out here. Come out. You can do this. Come out here. But what we learn about this story is that Peter was called out to do the impossible. Peter was called out to do the amazing. But when he would take his eyes off of Jesus and his focus would shift, something bad would happen. In Matthew 14, it says, Then Peter got down out of the boat and walked on the water and came towards Jesus. But here we go. But when he saw the wind, when he saw the obstacles, when he saw the fears, when he saw the excuses, when he saw the reasons why not, he was afraid. And beginning, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. I share this story because it can be easy to hear this story. It can be easy to read this story and think this. Peter, what are you doing? Jesus is standing right in front of you. He's walking on the water. He's doing the amazing. And he's calling you out to do the same thing. And we can think, Peter, come on, bro. Can I tell you that we in this story are Peter, That God is calling us to more and he's standing in front of us and he's saying if you keep your eyes off of the obstacles, if you keep your focus off the fears, off the worries, off the doubts, off the excuses, off the insecurities, and you keep them on me, I will lead you to more. I will lead you to do the impossible. I will lead you to do the incredible, the amazing, the unthinkable. So we are placed with the same potential that Peter had to walk on the water. The same potential that Peter had to keep his eyes on Jesus and walk on water is in you. So it begs a question, if that potential is inside of us and all it takes to do the amazing, the more that God is calling us to, is to just keep our eyes off the obstacles and keep them on Jesus? Then here's a question. Is my focus on Jesus or the obstacles? Is my focus on Jesus or the obstacles? Where is our focus I remember when I was moving to Indiana, I'd been offered the position to come on staff here, and I hadn't accepted it yet, and I was walking through the process. Um, I was going to be stepping off staff at a church that I was a pastor at for about eight years, and there were a lot of fears, a lot of obstacles that had popped up as I was like praying through and considering whether coming on staff here. I wanted to share some of the obstacles. Um, I didn't know anyone here. I'd only been here one time, and it was for less than 24 hours. I'd never been this far north before, <laughs> really, which it was pretty, it's cold here, right, you know, yeah. I'd only been to one service here, and I was like, what if they're weird? <laughs> then I was like, they are, and I fit right in, like, I'm weird too. <laughs> I share this not to just focus on my obstacles, but I share this because I want us to see the process that I went through, because the process, there was a particular moment in the process I didn't do, didn't do it well. Um, when I was here, I had had my phone out, and I'd opened my notes app on my phone, and I created a pros and cons list, and it was just fears and worries, and it was like, what if I move there, and then they fire me, and then like I'm stuck in the blizzard up there, like what happens, like... Like, what happens if I get there and they really don't like me? Or what if I don't like them? Or what if it doesn't? Like, all these things. And I remember just for days I was dwelling on this. And there's one day I'm in my car driving, and I'll never forget this. I'm in my car driving, and I'm praying through, and I'm thinking of these fears. And I felt the presence of God kind of fall in my car. And and God looked at me and was like, what are you doing? Why don't you just keep your eyes on me? And I felt this level of conviction where I just started repenting. I deleted that app and I was like, okay, God, my focus is on you. And here's the thing. When I took my eyes and I took my focus off of the obstacles and I placed them on Jesus, what I saw was this. Jesus met me in the moment and he called me to more. And ultimately when I did that, I ended up accepting the job here. And I'm not saying that to self-glorify myself, but what I'm saying is this, is I've experienced God move in me and around me. I met my wife here. God has done so many amazing amazing things here. And that happened when I took the focus off the insecurities, off the fears, all the, op- off all the obstacles, and I placed them on Jesus. And I want you to know that God is calling you to more. God is calling you to more, to take your eyes off the obstacles 
or as Elisha did, to burn the plows in your life, the excuses, the reasons why not, and to step into the more. We all must burn the plows in our lives to step into what God is calling us to do. In Colossians chapter three, it challenges us this way. It says, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. On things above. It's, we're called to have a heavenly perspective a perspective that doesn't focus on the things around us that's saying, yeah, the winds may come, the fears may come, the insecurities may be there, but my focus aren't on the reasons why not. My focus is on Jesus. In Proverbs chapter four, it says, let your eyes look straight ahead, straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Give careful thought to the paths of your feet and be steadfast in all your ways. Do not turn to the right or the left. Keep your foot from evil. So we should personalize this in our lives. We should personalize this. Is there a plow or multiple plows in your life that it's time to burn? Are there multiple plows that it's time to burn to get rid of, to step into the potential that God has placed on you in your life? I thought of a few examples, and I want us to lean into the Spirit and consider maybe this one is you. There's some of us in here that that plow that it's time for you to burn is an app on your phone. That app has been leading you away from ultimately experiencing what God is calling you to do and what God is calling you to be. And you know it's time. Maybe it's something with social media, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, all the other stuff. Maybe it's time to burn that plow and to step into the potential that God has placed in your life. Maybe there's a friendship. It's toxic. It's leading you away from where God is calling you to go, what God is calling you to do. Now listen, you can't burn your friends. You can't set them on fire. So it's not what I'm saying, okay? But maybe it's time to cut that tie and to say, listen, this is done. I have to step into what God, maybe, maybe there's something that you're involved in. You're watching something, you're doing something, you're listening to something, you're, you're talking about things that you shouldn't, and it's time to burn that plow to step into what God has called you to do. So I don't know if I named yours, if I said yours, but here's the thing for all of us to consider, and this is my closing challenge, and you can fill this in. Keep your eyes on Jesus and burn the plow. Keep your eyes on Jesus and burn the plow. Eliminate the obstacles, burn the plows in your lives that can so easily take you away and your focus off of what Jesus is calling us to do. And we're heading into a new year. And a new year is a great opportunity to let the old die away and to step into the new. As 2023 comes to an end and we step into 2024, my encouragement, my hope for all of us is that we would let the things that need to burn, burn away and we keep our eyes on Jesus. And this is the year that we unlock the potential that that God has placed in every single one of our lives. So I would love that for us, and I believe that we can do that by finishing well and eliminating the obstacles. Would you stand? We're gonna move into a time of prayer.